So, Lori. <laughs> So, Lori, if you first discovered Lori from The Beekeeper's Apprentice, you've got a good, you know, year or two's worth of reading for um, her other books, her other series, and her other standalone books. And, you know, the thing for me when I was telling Lori in the car when we were coming down here is that the first, I think, three, four, or five pages of Beekeeper's Apprentice, and I just went, this is the book I wish I had when I was a teenager, because I imagined myself in all these adventures and in all these world-changing events, and, and that is definitely um, Mary Russell as she continues through the series. So um, tonight, you know, you're lucky, or we're lucky to have copies for you of her latest book, so that means if you haven't read the first, you've got 11 books, you know, to catch up um, until you get to this book. And so um, with that, I'm going to let um, Kevin and Laurie take over, and... Thank you all. Hello? Is this on? I don't know if this is on or not. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, thank you, Kitsap Regional Libraries. You guys are the coolest. Every event you've done with me has been so classy and elegant, contrary to me. Um, and it's just been great. And now here I get to be with Lori R. King. This is so cool. And I want to thank these gentlemen over here who let us have their building. This is so beautiful. It's just so gorgeous. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Dave. Um, so I want to get right away to a serious question. Okay. Um, what's your favorite Kevin O'Brien book? And if Kevin O'Brien was in a burning building with the last Kevin O'Brien book, who would you say first, him or his book? About Lori. Yes. <laughs> the book, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. No. I mean, there's nothing like the first, is there? No. No. There's nothing like it. And speaking of first, so your first book was a grave, a grave talent. talent, which okay, I want to find out about this. So, your first time out, you get the Edgar Award. Am I right. jealous much or what? I, I know. mean. <laughs> Did you, did you, are there any editors or publishers out there, or agents that are right now kicking themselves because oh, yeah. they said no thank you? Oh, yeah, yeah. Get out of here, okay? Oh, yeah. Uh, I, no, you guys, I named, talk amongst yourselves. Yeah. <laughs> I, I name no names, but it is great fun. Yeah. yeah. Just sort of say, you, you could have had this, honey. <laughs> I think, uh, I mean, I, I actually wrote two books before I wrote A Grave Talent. I wrote the first two of the, uh, the one and three of the Beekeeper series. And the first one I sold was A Grave Talent. And I, I mean, looking back at it, it was probably really good because the, the Mary Russell series would not have won an Edgar. It's not an Edgar type book. Um, Edgar's are terribly serious awards. They're the Mystery Writers of America. And although it's uh, every year the committee changes, um, the judges on the committee changed. Nonetheless, there's, there's certain kinds of flavors of books they're looking for. And Russell has never been nominated. Um, okay, the, that makes me feel a little bit better. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, you know, there, it's, it's interesting, the number of extremely successful writers who have never been even nominated. For yeah, I talked to Lee Childs. He said the same thing. Yeah. He, wasn't, he hasn't at least won one, I know. No, he hasn't won one. He was nominated for his first one. Um, yeah, I mean, Sue Grafton has never has never won. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, it has nothing to do with the popularity. It has to do with the committee, the year that your kind of book comes out. Um, so I was very fortunate in the year um, Grave Talent came out that it was a first novel because it would not have won against the, you know, the grown-up novels um, of that year. <laughs> and it was, a, you know, it was enough of a, um, a a hard kind of crime that it, it won. And it also won the Creasy Award in England for, for the first book. So I was, you know, it was, a, it was a lovely happenstance. I would have enjoyed having Russell out three or four years earlier, but it worked out fine. So that was so. on the back burner for you and while, while you were, did yeah. you push all three at the same time or uh, were you? Well, I, I sort of, the way the publishing world works, um, there are very few publishing houses that will take books, what they call over the transom. You know, you sort of envision somebody slipping, at, you know, the la please, please look at my book. I'm concerned. For God's sakes, lock the door. Here she comes again. Um, 
But over the transom just means that it, it's not agented. You don't have an agent. You just send it off on your own. And I did that for the did first you? year or two um, with, you know, a, Terrible results. I, you know, one of the houses lost the book. One of them took four months to say they couldn't find it. They, you know, all uh, round and around and around. And I finally got an agent, and she was the one who who sold the thing. Oh my God. Um, but it was um, it was funny because when I when I was nominated for for the Edgar, I was at they have this big fancy dinner, you know, black tie and everything else. And, I mean, I'm from Santa Cruz. These are, these are my fancy shoes, guys. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't do heels. Um, and, um, and so I'm, I'm there at this dinner, and everyone is, you know, really excited because, um, you know, I'm, I'm the nominee, I'm the new, new writer, and all the rest of it. And um, um, somebody, somebody says to me, um, oh, it's, it's so great how you were just an overnight success. <laughs> you just sprung fully formed from the brow of Zeus. And I, and I thought, are you insane? <laughs> you know, I wrote this book in 1987, and it was published in 1993, and won a prize in 94. I mean, you know, it, it was a very typical career. I mean, you, you were yeah. the same way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. How, how long did it take you to get your first? Oh, God. Um, probably about... True uh, confessions yeah, from here. Yeah, okay. About four or five years. Yeah. yeah. And I, I actually had to send it out myself, um, mm -hmm. forging my agent's name. Because she kind of <laughs> lost track of where the book was. And there's, so, there's no pride in this, yeah, in this yeah, business. Yeah, yeah. I did. I borrowed her stationery, and I told her, I'm going to send it out myself, and I forged her name. And that's, <laughs> we got it to St. Martin's Press. Oh, that's a terrible I know, story. I know, a terrible story. It really, terrible. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> but I, did you start out writing? How did you get interested in writing? Because you started out uh, in theology. You, yeah. That was your main interest Yeah, I couldn't while. make any money in God. No? Um, <laughs> No, I, I... Unlike a lot of people we know. Yeah, I just, you know, it's, I can't, I just couldn't bring myself to. Um, no, I, I did a, a BA degree in, in um, comparative religion, and then I went on and did a master's in Old Testament theology. And at that point, had to look at a life of academia, which would involve about 10 years worth of um, PhD. I mean, seven years just languages. Do you want to know the language? <laughs> um, and my husband at the time was looking at retirement. He was 30 years older than I, and so he was in his 60s and saying, um, <laughs> you really want to do this? And so um, when the kids were, were in uh, school, at one September 1987, I, I sat down and started writing a novel, figuring it was something I could do in the time that sort of fit into my life. And, and I was very fortunate in that I sold... Um, I, I sold the first one before I had to actually go out and get a job. <laughs> wow. and my, my first few years, I made a lot more money on international sales than I did um, U.S. Me uh, too. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Reader's Digest and any kind of movie option, that's, that's where the money is. Uh, so it's like. But did you have like a space where you wrote when you were, you know, back when you were starting, like by the, I just picture you by the washer machine, like at a little desk. <laughs> did I get a stink eye there? Oh yeah. Maybe I better look at a change of clothes here. <laughs> I look like somebody who spends too much time in the laundry. Um, I think I got that from John Grisham. He said his, he had a desk right by the, Washing machine. So yeah, right. I'm mm -hmm, sure. Okay. Uh, Backing up. Dee, dee, dee. <laughs> no, I had, uh, you know, I had, I had a room that I worked in. Um, the, in fact, the only time that I haven't had a room that I worked in is this year, because I moved house in August, and uh, the the study is the last thing to get built, and so my study is still a garage full of cartons. Oh, um, and so I, I have a, a big stuffed chair that is in the corner of the bedroom, and that's my study. So I, you know, and it's nice to know that you can be flexible. I mean, I wrote, I wrote my first books. Actually, I wrote an awful lot of them. It's, it sounds a little odd. Behind the wheel of the car. Um, the wheel, the car was not running at the time. I would, I would take my kids um, to, um, to piano practice or my son was on soccer teams. And instead of going in and gabbing with, them, with the other moms, 
I would sit with a, an oversized clipboard and my, uh, my pad and fountain pen and I would write. And, you know, I'd write for an hour and then go home. Um, and, you know, it's, it's amazing how you can do that when you're first getting started because you're so excited oh, by yes. it. Oh, yeah. And yeah. then it becomes a job and you think, oh my God, I have to have a study. Oh. Um, <laughs> even if you're not making any money off of it. <laughs> um, but I, I was really pleased this year to find that I could write, uh, I mean, not literally behind the wheel of the car, but sort of figuratively in a, in a really less than ideal situation with, you know, workmen on the roof and the rest of it. So. Um, <laughs> Of course, the book took me forever to do, so that might, <laughs> might have something to do with it. But, you know, not to be recommended anyway. And so St. Martin's, a, a year later, um, decided they wanted to buy uh, a grave talent. And so I get a phone call from my agent um, and, and just sort of shrieked. And it was, it was really exciting because by that time, you know, it had been three and a half years of, no, we didn't want it, no, well, I thought I'd send it here, and maybe they'd look at that, no, no, so, um, you know, it's, um, it's, it's thrilling. Did you have any expectations when it came out? I know when my, I was St. Martin's too, and mm -hmm. I thought there would be jubilation in the streets, yeah. and people would be, <laughs> yeah. yeah, on the cover of People magazine, yeah. you your know. postman would, would ask yeah. for your signature. Yeah, exactly. Other Those than just when they were delivering something. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I was right after a book signing. I was in Nordstrom, and this one guy was across from me, like kept going like this, and, and I was like, "Well, he recognizes me from the back of the actors." And the guy comes up to me and goes, "Kevin O'Brien?" And I said, "Yes." And he goes, "I'm Chip Morris. I went to high school with you." <laughs> Get out of here, you SOB! I thought you were hot. <laughs> Damn. Did, did you, you know, did you have any big expectations of things, you know? happening when you first, uh, but it sounds like they were kind of met, but. <coughs> yeah, I, th I think, um, I mean, it's, it, it's always great when you can impress your kids. <laughs> I mean, that, that really is point to impress your kids. So that when my daughter and I, she was 15 or so, 15, we're Ooh. walking through a mall in Boston. She was Boston. in a mall and she was I know. 15? I know. She was seen with you? It was, yeah. <laughs> and somebody came up and said, are you Laura King? I just love it. I, listened, I had about three books out. And she, she said, oh, that lady recognized you. Did you know her? <laughs> Meaning, did you pay her? <laughs> so, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's lovely when you can, you know, when, when I visited um, her in, she was doing a year, uh, a semester in DC in 2001, and um, I went there on, on book tour. There was, there was a conference, and so I went. And she, she, she invited uh, some of her friends to go out to dinner with us and said, this is my mom, the writer. And afterwards, one of her, um, one of her fellow students at university level um, happened to see a display of my books in the bookstore. And he came to her and he said, your mom's a writer. And she said, yeah, I, I told you that. She said, and he said, I thought you meant she wrote like haiku and stuff. <laughs> Yeah, they so, don't take you seriously until they see that stand with your mm, books all over yeah. it. Oh my God, I love it. So you switched, you started out with Mary Russell, but Kate Martinelli came, she was your third book, but actually your first book published. Right, yeah. Wow. yeah. Did you know when you wrote, well, you did, that this was the beginning of something for both Mary Russell and Kate, that they were going to be revisited again and again, or did you... Kind of, did you think? To some extent, I, th I thought of the Martinelli as a, as a novel. Mm -hmm. And, and y you know, you don't write a novel that's a first of a series. Um, obviously, looking back, you publish it, it's a story about a cop, right? And, and a murder. And so oh, it's going to be categorized as a mystery, right? But I, I just didn't think about it. I thought of it as a, as a novel. And so um, when my editor talked to me about what they wanted to do next, I, I kind of, oh, right, um, next. <laughs> <laughs> and, and of course, two small kids, full-time demands. It was difficult to, to write. It was difficult to write a book a year, I but I had year, two no. that were already sort of more or less ready to go, which was a great blessing, because it meant I could do a book a year without 
driving my family absolutely nuts. <laughs> you know, relatively nuts, I'm happy with, but, you know. <laughs> so what was it like getting your like first fan letters, and what are some of the more interesting, we were talking about this in the car, more interesting fan letters when you? I, it's, it's, it is interesting. I'm one of my first um, correspondents um, was a woman who wrote this very thoughtful two or three page. I mean, now you'd sort of instantly categorize her as a stalker and say, okay, <laughs> yep. don't take anything from her. But she was very interested in the, th the theological um, aspect of the, f the first couple of, of Russell books. And in fact, she, um, she and I would, you know, sort of discuss things. And this is before email. Um, and, and so we'd send letters back and forth. And um, she started a, the first Mary Russell fan website. Um, and it was, it's the only website I've ever seen that starts off with a theological disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> because she's a very conservative Christian. Oh. And she, she wanted you, you know, people to know that, um, that she didn't agree with everything Lori King said, either in religious or political means. She had, she had a lot of problems with my feminism, mostly because she didn't understand my definition of feminism, which is basically, if you do the job, you earn the money. A and when it boils down to that, you kind of say, oh, uh, okay, we're not burning bras here, no. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, but, you know, so we started with a theological disclaimer, which I, I think, you know, is surely something to be proud of. <laughs> Have you ever had a theological disclaimer no, on your never, career? never. <laughs> I've had a few disclaimers, but not theological. <laughs> I want to go back to theology for a second, because it reminded me. Oh, that. by all means. Like, yeah, I knew you'd like that. When I was a kid, I used to uh, read, they used to have these um, little pamphlets, like stories about the Old Testament uh, in the back of our church, and you could you know, put a dime in the thing. It probably cost a dollar, I paid a dime. But it was, <laughs> there was, you put something in the change thing and then you took a book and I love that stuff. And, it, cause it, and I, think, I think as an author, I think that set the groundwork, I think, for me. And is that, do you think it was the same way for you, the story behind religion and everything else, the stories that are involved? Yeah, when I, my, my BA was in comparative religion, so it was looking at all kinds of different religious traditions. But I then focused on um, the Judeo-Christian Judeo -Christian tradition for my MA, looking at um, Old Testament, and I did my thesis on the um, feminine aspects of God in the Old Testament. And what fascinated me was how you could trace, like a thread through a necklace, um, a story that runs from pre-Israelite Canaan through the Old Testament, and then comes up in the New Testament. And how it is, the, the story has its own integrity and wholeness, but it also changes depending on the culture and the, their sense of the world. And that just fascinated me, and that was why I, I was interested in, in going on and doing a PhD, but not with somebody who you know, needs to stop earning an income at some point. <laughs> um, and, and so when I started writing, I think one of the reasons I enjoy mysteries as a writer is that you, you take the basic, you, you know, I mean, there, there's these sort of truisms that there's only seven stories in the world. And mm -hmm. so you're basically rewriting the kinds of stories that exist. But you're looking at it from a completely different point of view each time. So that, you know, you may write a story um, about a, a, a woman cop in San Francisco, you know, faced with an artist, and I may write a book about, and they're going to be areas where you deal with the same material, right. but you're gonna come up with a very, very different story. Um, it, it's like whenever, whenever you're at a party, I'm sure you had this happen once or twice. You're at a party and somebody comes up to you and says, I've got a great idea oh, for a story. No, never. You know, 
Yeah. And my it's, dog did the cutest yeah. thing, and I think you should write about it. You, you know, should. Oh, God, I mean, and, you somebody know, take the, a cocaine mallet to my head. <laughs> 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 the, what is hard to explain is that the, the idea is not the story. Right. The idea has nothing to do with the story. The idea is just the idea that gets you writing the story. And, um, and so, you know, that was what interested me in studying the Old Testament. And I think that in crime fiction, you have the same, you have the same thing. Because in the Old Testament, you have all these places where, for example, in poetry, there'll be two verses that are almost identical with one slight change of vocabulary. And it's the change in vocabulary that contains the truth that that's what that writer was going for, is you know, looking at something from two slightly different points of view. And that's what you're doing in crime writing, is right. you're giving um, the testimony of this witness and that witness, and here's the same, and yet it's different. So. so but, but you know, I think also the stories you read in the Bible are all about <laughs> justice, and I think that's, mm -hmm. I know, I always feel that writing about crime or murder stories, you know, I've been approached by some people and they're like, why do you write these awful stories, you know? Oh, and, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> thank you very much. And, um, and I think it's really because when you read um, fiction, there's, justice is always somehow served. And I think, I think the Bible always has that too. There's always some... Well, uh, to me, that's one of the, the joys of crime fiction is that you have a plot and you have a conclusion. Right. And at the conclusion, you have to have some kind of, of finish and resolution to the story. That your, the, the untimely death that has been the thread of the entire story and the reason for telling the story um, is in some way resolved. And it always really makes me angry when I come upon writers who try to make their mystery literary by giving it an uncertain ending. Oh, God, yeah. You know? I mean, it just pisses me off. Yeah, because there's, me too. You know, yeah. it, it's not necessary, and it's cheap. Uh, tell me how you feel about it, Laurie. Um, Don't you know, sugarcoat it, OK, yeah, Laurie? No, I mean, it, that's the, the point of crime fiction is to, is to work through. Right an injustice and to restore some kind of order to the world. And if you're not doing that, then why tell a story? You're not exactly. tell, you know, tell a novel, write a novel. Do you feel, and this is one reason I have not done a series, maybe also because no one's cared enough about any of my characters, but <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done a series because I'm a vo I've, I like to have that ending, you know? And it must be a challenge to know that there's going to be another book with Mary Russell in it but I'd like to wrap things up here. I mean, do you ever, when you're ever doing something like that, do you, no. that, do you feel like, you know, I really want to give this a Sacco finish, but, you know, I've, I've got another <laughs> in the series coming up, so what do I do? Yeah, I, I um, when I first wrote The Touchstone, um, I, I, I ended the book by basically killing everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I mean, Garp, the end yeah, of Garp. Okay, yeah, this is I how mean, this person dies, this person dies. Yeah, I mean, just basically, you know, you, the, the bomb and everybody, sort of one person <laughs> crawls away to tell a tale. And I, I thought it was great. But then in conversation with my editor, I, I realized that it wasn't, you know, to get the emotional impact of devastation, you didn't really have to kill everybody off. And so I sort of said, oh, well, this, this guy can live, and maybe, maybe they can live. <laughs> and so, so it wasn't until I got you know, well on into the rewrite that I thought, oh, there's actually enough people here to make another book out of it. <laughs> and so we had this discussion early on, should this be a series? Um, and because it had already been presented as a standalone, and because you know, everyone was thinking of it as a standalone, we didn't, <laughs> which has created a bit of confusion because <laughs> my next book is the sequel to that. So <laughs> it's now a series, but it's not really a series. <laughs> so, um, but I, I, think it's, I think it's true that when you have a series, you have to have um, something that's parallel to the main um, characters unless you're going to start carrying, cut, killing off your... I mean, Dana Stabenow is terrible with this because she just, she just chooses a, a character and says, okay, we'll just kill them off. And you think, I liked that character. Oh, I thought we were okay with that character. Nah, she's a cruel woman, is Dana. That's horrible. Um, 
and you know, but I have a limited number. Uh, you know, Holmes has already died once. You can't sort of kill him off again. And uh, and I think you know Russell killing Russell. Well, there's not. Uh, no, you don't what like that. Mrs. Hudson stories? <laughs> so um, you know, until until the the granddaughter gets old enough to handle the series on her own, which will be about 115 books from now. Um, I think that I think that I kind of am stuck with these characters. But it means that you then have to bring in external characters that the writer knows could be, I mean, the reader knows they could be disposable. Right. You know, so I have these, these lovely two people who have appeared in two or three of the books, Ali and Mahmoud. Mm -hmm. And you're never really sure, because Ali and Mahmoud might not make it through one Ooh. of these times. Uh -oh. You know, I'm <laughs> Are they, yeah, are they red shirts, oh. you know, or red camisas or whatever. Oh my gosh. And I think that, the, I mean, the Martinelli's work very much that way, that the Martinelli's, each of those five books has distinctive characters to each book. I mean, there's less overlap in the Martinelli's than there are in the, in the others. So that, you know, you have a series of characters that are pretty much only in that book. I mean, you might sort of see them referred to in a later book, mm -hmm. if they survive. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't um, kill them off. If right. I haven't killed them off, they may be referred to, but they're not, you know, you know each one has its discrete group of characters. And, and I think that's the way I get around the business of um, having a series, but having a, the weight of a non-series. Non yeah. That's so yeah. Cool. yeah. Well, and I think Jamie's going to take over for a second, but I just want to, your new book, telling people about your latest, is it Garment of Shadows? Garment of Shadows came out in September, yeah. So yeah, latest. and that's, um, um, Russell wakes up in Fez, Morocco, and doesn't know who she is. It's, mm. it's, it's my amnesia book. <laughs> Gotta love amnesia. Yeah, yeah. The next book that I'm working on is set in 1929 Paris. So that was a lot of fun. I had Man Ray is suspected of evil doing something. Wouldn't you suspect yeah. Man Ray? Yes. I mean, really, honestly, if you had to pick one, in, you know, wouldn't Man Ray definitely be behind you? And I get to say all kinds of really rude things about Hemingway. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, Jamie's going to yes, say like a word. Yes, I'd like a round of applause. Ooh.